Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Sam's Report. Um, not doing the show live today, for those of you who were looking for that, uh, mostly because I'm headed to Amsterdam. I'm actually going to be there for a week, so next week's show will likely not be live either. And, you know, we got to make the show go on. Uh, so I'll likely record it, I'm guessing, Thursday at some point. Um, but we will, we will figure that out. So I'm leaving... Uh, my flight leaves tomorrow at noon, then I'm flying to Boston. Paul and I are going to fly together because um, apparently I do not like my own sanity. And that is that. So this show is pre-recorded on Thursday, which the biggest implication of something like this is that the reader thread question that somebody else put up, which I very much appreciate, is not going to uh, be fully answered because people are going to post things after after this is recorded. And just for clarity's sake, it's 3 p.m. on Thursday and so I'll answer the questions that are there. But uh, anyways, uh, if you're looking for Xbox One, Xbox One X stuff, so I did a special edition podcast on Monday, mostly because um, I didn't want to wait until Friday. There was a lot of good stuff to talk about. Microsoft, I'm actually very pumped about this thing. Um, I still need a little bit more value prop, but I think we're going to get there, especially after talking to quite a few other people um, on inside the company. And so it will get there. But go check out that episode. It was recorded on Monday, and it's still completely relevant, so definitely check that out. Um, other things that came out about the Xbox One X since that podcast is Microsoft came out and said, hey, we're not really going to make a profit on the hardware. And people were like, oh, my God, this is like this is pretty normal. Every time they've launched a new console, they've never made money. Microsoft's model here is licensing. So every time you go buy an Xbox One X or Xbox One game, Microsoft makes a little bit of that revenue. At one point, I heard it was $7 per title. I don't really know what that is anymore um, I don't know if it's way higher or way lower or wh where it is but that's the idea so they want the they essentially sell this thing at a loss and then they recoup it on the sales of the games as a revenue stream of licensing because if you want to build a console or a game for a console you need Microsoft to support that and that's how they do it licensing and all that good stuff so don't like anybody who's saying that's like really bad don't that's totally normal um, the only one who kn I know who have tends to make money on their hardware actually is typically Nintendo. And I would imagine for the Switch, they're doing that. And speaking of the Switch, Microsoft is doing uh, cross-play, what they, I think they call it cross-play, which is so, we've all, we, we've seen it before where you can play from the uh, PC and Xbox One users play together. But now you can actually do it with some Nintendo people too. And it would work with Sony, but Sony's like, Haha, we're not going to support that. And so shame on Sony for not wanting to put the gamers first. Instead, they're putting their own stuff first. Uh, but anyways, that is that. And other things to go check out definitely at this point is that Microsoft has its new Office apps in the store. So this week, the Surface Laptop uh, is now shipping. It's shipping as of today, as of June 15th, or when this post, June 16th, you can go out and buy one. Uh, the Surface Pro, which we'll talk about here in a second, uh, is also shipping. And so, yeah, uh, you need the Office apps. They are in the store. Although, I'm going to check right now. As of this morning, I couldn't actually download. Oh, the store just crashed. Surprise, surprise. Uh, let's just try this again. See if the apps are actually working. Oh, I've got a search form, Office. And let's see. Can you download them now? Nope. As of right now, when you click the link in the store, it says, try again. Please, that page could not be loaded. Please try again later. Um, but Technically, they are in the store. Some people have said they've had access. Actually, there's specifically a uh, Dr. Windows underscore DE from, I'm assuming, Germany has a screenshot of him actually getting to that page and being able to download them. But uh, as of right now, I cannot do that. And so when it comes to Surface Laptop, uh, Microsoft didn't send me one. Actually, they didn't send too many people one. I, di I didn't get one. They sent me a Surface Pro instead, which is fine. Uh, I'll get a Surface Laptop here in a little bit per what they've told me. But anyways, so Surface Pro. You know, it, this is a wonderful machine. If you like the Surface Pro 4, think of this as the Surface Pro 4 that went to graduate school and got its master's in productivity, as corny as that sounds. Really what they did, it's just a lot of refinement. It's not, it's very much evolutionary, not revolutionary to any capacity. I mean, there's no USB Type-C in this thing. Um, it does have this nice blue Alcantara cover, although it, not, it doesn't smell anymore. But when I pulled the thing out of the box, it, it didn't smell too pleasant, but about 48 hours after that, it was cleared up. I've had this thing for a little over a week, and the new pen, obviously uh, more accurate, although it's it's good, although technically Apple's, I think, is better. This is 20 milliseconds, and Apple's is like 19. Um, I don't think anybody really ever able to see that with the eye, but you know what? Apple, um, to their credit, you know, I'm sure Microsoft would do the same. One thing that is going to go overlooked with this machine that I think is very important is that it is very quiet. So this is the i7 model, the top end, um, 16 gigs of RAM. And 
you can't hear the fan run. And it, it's wonderful. The things that plague the Pro 4 and even the Pro 3 is that you would always get this like sound with the surface when it was under load or just honestly just even random times you'd shut the, the lid or whatever and you just hear it running and you it was so annoying but microsoft just fixed that the, the this thing is completely silent at least you know to reason like i haven't heard it really spin up unless i'm very diligently looking for it and so the other thing to keep in mind is that the i5 and m3 models don't have fans at all and that is a big improvement just for your own sanity's sake. That's a good reason. So the question becomes, should you update if you have a Surface Pro 4? Honestly, I don't, I don't think you should, unless the fans are that annoying to you. I, I don't think that you should. If you have a Surface Pro 3 or anything prior, I think then you're going to get a lot of updates. You're going to get, um, essentially, you're going to go from, what, Broadwell or is it Haswell to... Uh, the latest gen so you're going to get performance not only in the silicon you're going to get an improved much improved display you're going to get a, a kickstand that goes all the way back into what microsoft calls studio mode the pro 4 doesn't do this and it, it's actually quite nice and they've done a good job here they they took something that was good and made it better um nothing crazy nothing you know out of line if you like the Surface Pro form factor, this is another, this is a great update. I have no real complaints other than the lack of a USB Type-C or Thunderbolt 3 port. That is the biggest downer at this point. Performance is fine. Battery life, I'm getting around eight and a half-ish hours. Just kind of depends. Yes, Microsoft Pitch is 13.5 hours, but I consider that really a vanity metric, mostly because they say, hey, you can get 13.5 hours of video playback. Nobody is opening this thing up and then just hitting play and letting it run for 13 and a half hours. You're browsing the web, you're writing, you're screwing around in Office, you're searching for whatever. Uh, I'm getting about eight and a half under extremely mixed use, including streaming music, um, writing, browsing the web, watching video. So eight and a half, I think, is a pretty good metric at this point for roughly what you're going to get. And again, the pen works well. I'm, I can't draw stick figures. And so, you know, for me, the, that extra sensitivity and extra degrees and tilts and all that stuff, I, I can't make use of that because I am functionally deficient when it comes to, to drawing uh, that is not one of the skills that I possess in my repertoire. And so you can go check this thing out. Start at $7.99, but to be honest, the sweet spot's right around $1,200. Uh, if you are a student, you can get a discount, and that applies to both Surface Laptop and the Surface Pro. Actually, all Surface things, you can get a student discount. So keep that in mind if you're looking to buy one. And they're out now, so you can go grab them. And that's that's really about it. And also remember that if you do have a Pro 3, your pen and your type cover will work. So... Uh, from that aspect, the upgrade can be a little bit cheaper because the type cover is 149 and the new pen, the new pen is a hundred bucks. It's not cheap. Uh, I don't know if Microsoft's trying to make up some margin on that or if they're trying to push into Apple territory a little bit, but the new pen is not cheap. And it's also not shipping in the box. Remember that. So Microsoft told me that only 30% of people actually use the pen on a regular, regular basis. And so they're, they're not shipping it in the box. And there you go. That's the Surface Pro 4. You can go check it out. My full review is up on Petri.com. I am taking this machine to Amsterdam. I'm not going to take a Surface Book. I'm going to actually take the Surface Pro. And that's going to give me a full week of do or die because I will have no backup machines. That's the only thing I'm running. And so it will be interesting to, to go in that route. I haven't traveled with the Surface Pro. Pro device in a while. I use them around the house quite a bit, but this will be, you know, full airplane. It's um, nine hours fl flying for me to get to Amsterdam. Obviously, I think it's 10 hours to get back because of the jet stream and flying into that stuff. And so this will be, um, you know, quite the, the test of this machine. And so I will, you know, provide an update next week. Other things that are happening in the world of Microsoft, placeholders. I told you guys for a while these things were coming soon and ta-da, here they are. Uh, placeholders are here or files on demand. And you can go check them out. You've got to be an insider running the latest build, and there's instructions online about how to get that up and running. I definitely think it's worth checking out. doesn't appear to be too buggy, but, um, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely got some things things going for it. So, uh, other big news in the server world, actually, this week. So, uh, Microsoft announced for on their server that they're moving Windows Server to rapid release. But it's going to mirror what Office and Windows are doing. And so what that means is you're going to have a long-term stability channel, not branch, but they're calling it long-term stability channel, and semi-annual channel. And so the semi-annual channel will actually update twice a year and feature updates. And the long-term servicing channel is like what you think of as Windows Server 2016. And so I would imagine the next one would probably be like 
like Windows Server 2019, something like that, and it'll most likely just be a roll-up of all the semi-annual channels into a long-term stability, which they're saying is two to three years. Um, one thing about the twice-a-year updates on the server side, you can skip one, so you really only have to update your server software once a year, and Microsoft is fully aware, because I talked to them extensively about this, that it's going to be a very slow process to get people into a model where they feel comfortable about updating their server software twice a year. Um, even once a year is probably going to be a little bit iffy at first, but you know, they're confident. This is the way the market's moving. This is the way they're moving. I, I think it's fun, fine and fantastic. You know, you don't have to opt into this and obviously server is much more sensitive than desktop because if server goes down, it knocks out, well, the company, if desktop goes down, it knocks out the user. And so this is coming. Uh, they're also repositioning nano server. Nano server is only going to be for containers now. And they're doing away with like the infrastructure type workload capabilities. So if you're running nano server and you're doing infrastructure work with that server environment, you're screwed. Um, they're going to reposition it as a container OS essentially. And they're going to cut it in half. It's like, I think 500 megs now. I think they said they're trying to get it under 250 megs or they've already gotten it under 250 megs. So it's lighter, thinner, faster, but it's only for containers. And so if you are using Nano Server for infrastructure, they recommend going to Server Core, uh, which is their kind of modernized version of Windows Server. They speak of proper, what we think of proper Windows Server as Windows Server with desktop experience. Um, they think of what you should be running your data center with as Server Core. And then there's Nano Server. So uh, that's the other stuff. The last big thing on the agenda is that this week Microsoft released a new patch for Windows XP and I'm assuming and I believe uh, server 2003 and so they're they were listing state sponsored attacks that were using this loophole and so I have really mixed opinions on this I wrote it up that this was a terrible mistake Microsoft said for many many years that they were done supporting Windows XP they made it clear as day that hey we're not going to do this and so when they start dropping updates for large exploits that are impacting that software, it sends a very confusing message. It's like, okay, is, you know, Windows XP is Schrodinger's cat at this point. It's dead and alive. Microsoft says it's dead, and yet they're still, this is the second patch they're issuing for Windows XP, and they're still servicing it. And so how do they explain that to people who have these long-term contracts uh, or long-term support contracts that are paying out the nose for Windows XP patches, and then people who are paying nothing are getting the most critical patches. So, it, you know, it's a real confusing message. They were saying it was a state-sponsored attack, and I fully agree that, you know, they should... It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't, because they, there's still critical infrastructures, like some hospitals that are running XP, that is their own fault, by the way, uh, being attacked by this and getting locked up and getting exploited. But at the same time, these, these institutions have had years to update. And if they can't update, maybe Microsoft, rather than offering support contracts, I mean, look, we'll give you a support contract. And in that, uh, you have to pay us 50,000 bucks and we'll give you solid consulting advice on how to upgrade. Um, 50,000 bucks should get you enough consulting hours at least to assess the situation how to update but these hospitals have to move everybody needs to move off xp it's a disservice to yourself and microsoft the problem microsoft faces is that if any version of windows gets compromised new or old it's a black eye on them because that's their code that was eventually exploited even though it's um what xp came out like 12 15 years ago so um yeah anyways that stuff came out and I don't know if there's going to be any more. Microsoft isn't saying. They keep saying this doesn't change the thing, that they're going to keep patching XP. But if they release another XP patch, they're just setting a dangerous precedent, especially when it comes to Windows 7. Because Windows people, there's, I get asked this every time I do a presentation in front of a group. And like two weeks ago, this happened. They said, what's the likelihood Microsoft is going to extend support for Windows 7? And I, I every time I tell them, you know, they keep telling us that they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. They're not going to extend support. Um, but then they go and do something like this with Windows XP and it under, undermines that message. And that's my take on that. Um, we, will, we will see how it plays out if Microsoft ever issues another update. So uh, that's the core news for the week. Let's jump into the questions. I know that there were some good ones and some that actually I tried to do some research on before the show, but I don't think I was able to fully find the answer. Uh, thank you to Simard57. He created it. Um, he says... Want to confirm something about files on demand on the OneDrive? The blog says always available files are a spe are specific to a device. This is indicated by the green check mark on a file explorer in the OneDrive app. Does this carry over to OneDrive.com using the browser? 
um, I'm not I'm not sure what you mean because the always available files when they say that they mean locally downloaded to your machine. So I think that indicator is only going to show up locally on your machine. And then his next question, he says, is there a way to discover on which devices are always available through the OneDrive app or on OneDrive? Hmm. I don't think so because I I want to say, and again, I still need to dig into this more. I believe that files on the device are local to that install. Because if you remember when you set up OneDrive, you tell it which folders to sync, and I believe it works that way. So you're going to have to uh, manually look and see on that machine. I think what you want is like a, a dashboard on OneDrive. It says, okay, on these three machines, this file's available, which that would be nice, but I don't believe that is available. Um... Another question is, it says, is there a list of devices Microsoft accepts for a trade-in for new Surface devices? I've looked for this and I actually looked briefly before the show and I couldn't find anything. I know it's the, the general rule, and this is no big surprise, is that the newer the, the, newer the device, the more money you're going to get. Um, you can, all you can do is try. You can take stuff in there. I don't know if you're going to be able to take like an iPhone 4, but I'm sure you can probably take 5S and anything else that like that and it'll work. Uh, and the last question says, if I restrict Windows 10 Pro from installing apps from outside the store, will it perform like Windows 10 as promises as fast for 1,000 days as it does on day one? Um, in theory, yes. The, the What you don't know or what you haven't been able to can't really determine is what kind of crap is installed already in the registry and all that stuff before you turn it on. So if you do a clean install and initially enable that, that's the pitch. So I will be curious to see if it holds true, if it holds true. And so uh, that's really it, guys. That's really it. The insider tip of the week is that, you know, if you're looking to buy a Surface device, especially a mobile device that's not a Surface book, uh, today, this week is the best time to do it. You're going to get the longest amount of time before the device gets updated, especially for back to school. Now's a good time to start looking at buying that stuff. That's why this stuff is out now is for back to school explicitly. Microsoft, I don't think they publicly said that, but that's why they're shipping them now. And so if you buy a Surface laptop, you know, in the next couple of weeks, you're going to have a very long life cycle where that is the premier device in that category from Microsoft. So if you're looking to buy, now is a good time. Surface Book is a little bit more dicey. Um, I, we're thinking that it's going to get updated this fall. I, I would love a Surface Book in Burgundy. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, so we will look and see you guys. Uh, you know, that's really about it for this week. Just trying to keep it, um, I don't know, short. I actually can't see a timer on this view that I'm trying out. And so I will be around next week. I'm going to be in Amsterdam. So if you're in Amsterdam, we're actually doing a small meetup. I believe it's on Wednesday and it's actually in Harlem. So if you are in that area, definitely kind of check out Paul and myself's Twitter accounts because we will be tweeting about that. Mary Jo Foley is going to be there. Um, there's going to be some other good people actually from Microsoft and all sorts of fun stuff. And so you can actually find all the details on Office 365 Engage. You can still sign up if you want to come, but um, that's where we will be news should be flowing as always although it's going to be a little bit more difficult late in the evening because paul and i will be gallivanting around um the, the fine city of amsterdam so as always guys have yourselves a wonderful weekend if you're a father have a happy father's day and i will catch you right back here next week thanks for tuning in